Welcome to Disrespectfully Agree with LJ and Oatman. I'm LJ, and across from me is Oatman. Hello, everybody. The world cried out for another podcast about entertainment, (laughs) and we have heeded that call. And uh, given the popularity of podcasts, I think it's important that we get the word out on a little film that more people need to see, Black Panther. (laughs) You've heard of this movie? I have heard of it. Have you seen the film? As an African-American, it's sort of like a state requirement that you go at least twice, so yes. Oh, I didn't. Okay. I didn't get that memo. Yeah, well, I mean, you didn't get the black memo, of course. You're, not, you're not on that. I'm not on the black memo <laughs> no. list? No, no, no. I'm not on Twitter. I can't So let alone black Twitter is off. See, it's exactly. way off. The, I can't. Black Twitter is a whole other thing. <laughs> yeah. All right, Oatman. <clears throat> you're a man of opinions. I am. How was the Black Panther? It was outstanding. In fact, it was better than I thought it would be. It was one of those things where it started getting all of this build up and, oh, Black Panther, blah, 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 blah. There's all of this cultural stuff around it. And, oh, it's the blackest movie ever. Oh, it's a Mar- Marvel movie. Spike and, Lee would beg to differ. It, well, yeah, the blackest Spike, movie ever. Oh, my God. Black, uh, Spike Lee would beg to differ about everything. <laughs> uh, so I, I'm hearing all of this buzz about it. And then I see people with the African gear. And I'm like, okay. I know this is going to be bullshit, but fine. I'll I'll do my part. I'll do my dance. And so I go to see it, and I, I gotta admit, I was like, wow, this this is this is one of the best Marvel movies I've ever seen. And I'm a Marvel fan. I love Marvel. I love Iron Man. I love X Men. I mean, I love all of that so stuff. So let's take a temperature here of the modern Marvel uh, oeuvre, the Marvel verse, mm-hmm. as it is, uh, starting with Iron Man. Let's say, mm-hmm. what is uh, let's get calibrated. What, what's your top three ranking? Mm, I would probably have to say Winter Soldier. I really love that. Uh, then I would probably go for Logan. Okay. Which I just thought was amazing for really different reasons. That first X-Man, because in some ways that was my passport into this new world of superhero movies, okay. where there was sort of a new sensibility. That, that was one of those movies, when I saw it, I left the theater like, wow, what was that? What just happened there? That I was felt a- the same way, but I don't think it was a positive experience as much for me. Well, for me it was, because I, you know, I came up in the age of Batman... Michael Keaton, well, and so did I. Penguin, and all of that, and and when I saw this, uh, now, Penguin, I'll grant you, yeah, yeah. When I saw this, I said, "Oh, okay, this is something different. This is this is interesting to me." Uh, and it wasn't until more the, grounded. Yeah, it wasn't until the second set of Batman's that I really got into Batman. When I saw that first set with Michael Keaton, which which one's the second set? Uh, when we when we got Don't into the Kilmer. Christian when we got into the okay. Christian Bale right. era, and we got <laughs> grounded into these characters, and it became a lot grittier, and it became a lot more rooted in a reality and less of sort of a campy reality. Mm-hmm. I think in some ways, even though I'm sure they would deny this, but that Michael Keaton it owed a lot to the Adam West Batman, even though they said, no, it's, this isn't it at all. It's dark, and we have on a different suit. No, there's a lot of the camp from that 60s era in that... Particularly with the Joker character. It, absolutely. Yeah. Just a lot of camp in it, and I don't think that that was bad, but when I saw it, I was like, oh, okay, I know what that is. I know how to process this, but when I saw the first X-Men, when I saw Christian Bale's Batman, I was like, okay, this is something that may have a a layer or two that I have to dig into that I might have to to deconstruct a little more closely. Okay. Uh, sort of like how the comic books are. You know, you read the comic books and then you almost have to deconstruct some stuff. But the the, the so the Nolan trilogy, uh, third movie aside, is more rooted in reality. Yeah. Then we get to Black Panther now. Mm-hmm. Not so much. Uh, very much so. Really? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, rooted in reality in the sense that there are a lot of African-American related tropes that it deals with. Okay. A lot of conversations that go on in the African-American community that aren't often televised. Portrayed. Or portrayed, right. yes. And so to have that portrayed in a superhero movie is weird, but very much rooted in reality. You know, when, when Killmonger looks at this African princess and says, hey, what's up, auntie? Mm-hmm. That that is a that is right. that is American African cultures right. clashing in a way. Yeah, you may think you the queen, but to me, you just my auntie from the picnic. 
There's a so, lot going on there. It's it's subtle, but it boy, it's there. I got you. So you're coming out. You're focusing more on the the way the characters behave and speak. Strictly in the writing. Okay. That that's strictly writing. It, that the the. I was thinking are, more broadly, universe wise. Uh, we're talking from the Nolan verse to the something like Black Panther. It's extremely. It's it's cartoonish. The world hmm. building, and not to the extent of a Tim Burton. No, that, that's fair. Or a Schumacher, but it is certainly much more uh, otherworldly that's and fair. fantastical. That's fair. I think the themes is the themes in it are what rooted in something interesting. Like I've not seen any movie where a guy sits on his knees and as he's doing as he's dying, he's contemplating. Right, spoilers! Spoiler alert! <laughs> coming up. <laughs> well, I, I'm not mentioning the character. Oh, okay. But the character is then um, contemplating the middle passage. I mean, you know that's. <laughs> You know, he's contemplating sort of the journey from the the slave from Africa coming to America, and he gives a line, something to the level of, I understand what that slave understood, Mm -hmm. which is death is preferable uh, to captivity. Is it? (laughs) Well, we can have that debate. (laughs) But but at least he's making that argument. He's essentially making the argument, because anybody who knows the thing about the Middle Passage, many of those slaves, in order to become slaves, there were there was a grouping of them that would jump off the ship sure. and jump to their death. And he then is embodying the ethos of that slave who says, I'm not going to be a slave. I'd rather jump and die. I thought that was a really powerful moment. Yeah, I thought that was good. I have, I, I'm curious to get your opinion on the performance, Killmonger. I thought it was I've, th- I've heard a lot of talk about how it, how his performance is fantastic. I, I felt okay. like his performance in particular f- seemed a bit put on, a bit of a guy play acting, hmm. uh, a guy who wasn't necessarily right for that particular kind of attitude. He felt like he was forced. You know what it reminded me of hmm. is me. Go with me on this. Okay, I'm wrong. I was cast, I'm riding the train. Yeah, I, no one else will make this comparison but me. I was cast at I think it was 18 years old. I was cast in a professional production of Julius Caesar. Ah, as Julius Caesar. <laughs> okay, that was wrong. <laughs> I should now that they they cast it was all professional actors and one student. Uh-huh. I was the student, and I I imagine they thought well this is. This guy dies halfway through, so uh-huh. the other roles are a bit more important. But all that said, I was not right for that role. I tried as best as I could to put on that kind of authority, That's but I th- wasn't capable of it. That's fair. I-, I think part of what comes into this is audience expectation. So for that actor who I know well, there is sort of an expectation because the first time we saw him, he was playing a drug dealer and a gangbanger. Which is interesting is the character that is in the film, which is supposed to be him as a young man, is the character we came to know that actor as on The Wire, which was a young thug. Uh, so that's the first time we really see uh, Michael B. Jordan is as a young thug. And then probably where we first see him emerge as a, an actor who gets so, sort of critically acclaimed, mm-hmm. the first time that he makes that emergence is as a young drug dealer, uh, a young urban drug dealer with anger problems who ultimately is uh, shot and killed by transit cops. I think in the Northwest somewhere, Seattle area somewhere, I believe. He plays basically Oscar Grant, the real-life gentleman. He portrays him in Fruitvale Station, which obviously was Ryan Coogler, the writer and director of Black Panther, uh, his first big film. I think it's his first film, right. but certainly where we get to know him from. And so I think for the audience that knows that actor... Um, I would expect him to play a role like that because that's what I've seen him play. It's what I've seen him... That's not the part I object to. It's the part where he... It's the speech at the end. It's the part where he portrays himself as this government-trained killer. That's the part... That's the side of his performance that rang hollow to me. Well, I would say this, and, and it's funny because... As the, at the, at, as the comic book, there was sort of a conscious effort to break Black Panther apart from the Black Panther movement. 
But I think it's something very specific at the fact that they root this film in Oakland because the director is from Oakland. And so if you if you study the work of the Black Panthers, they were very similar to that. They were thugs some of them, who, who also would quote Mao Zedong. So th- there was always that duality of being a scholar and also being a nigga in the street. Mm-hmm. And I think in some ways, I think that's what Kugler was trying to capture. I that, agree. And I think that for me, I, I bought that. I, I saw him as this this sort of trained thug. He started as, as being in the hood of Oakland, and now he goes on to sort of be this... Uh, no, I get. I, I I I like the idea. I thought it was conceptually brilliant. I saw an actor delivering lines. I didn't see that. I, I'm, I'll be honest with you. I just I just didn't see that. Hmm. I, I, but part of it too, like I said, it may just be audience expectation. Maybe because I know of his work, I expect him to be that. I've seen him do that. I've seen him do that at a very high level. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen Fruitvale Station, Mm-mm. of which he's brilliant and got a lot of critical acclaim. I'm not sure if you saw him in. Um, if you saw him in um, The Wire. Which, which season is he in? I don't remember. They, they all blend for me. I watched uh, seasons one and two, and I started the first episode of season three, and I turned to my viewing partner at the time, and I said, do you want to keep doing this? <laughs> and we both agreed, no. We don't. It was... <laughs> well, see, I think part of it is... Well, I think that's fair. That, that makes a lot of sense. But like, as somebody who I love The Wire, and so as somebody who liked that... I bought that characterization, but then again, I like different things. So for me, my expectation, I, I felt he, I, I felt he met that bar. I thought I was like, okay, I'm buying this. Okay, it, it it worked for me. But then again, I expect that from that actor. What's your stand on the removal of the lesbian subplot? Uh, I liked it and didn't like it. I think it was problematic in that they removed it. But I must admit, what they did with it instead, I really liked. Mm-hmm. Just because it led to a, a scene which I thought was amazing in the movie. So it's almost like, wait a minute, how are you going to remove this very important representation? Da, 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 da. Oh, wow, I really like that scene. <laughs> <laughs> and had they not removed it, I don't get that scene. Mm. Uh, which scene are we talking about? Well, essentially, it's the scene in which her lover is astride a, ry- a rhino. Mm-hmm. And because she is his lover, you or at least I extrapolated that she had watched this rhino grow up when she would come visit her lover. And in the middle of the battle scene, she stands in front of the rhino and the rhino is coming at her and she's standing there and it stops. And then it licks his face or licks her her face. face. And then there's that wonderful, that's a wonderful scene. I love that action wise. Then when he gets off of that rhino, there's an interaction between them in which one has to yield, and finally he yields. Yeah, I thought that was extremely powerful. I like. I thought it was a powerful scene, but you and I have a disagreement about that moment with the uh, the rhino. Oh, love that! <laughs> it's I, I love it too, but it I feel like it deflates the the drama. Of Absolutely, the it does, and that's what I love about it. That's what I hate about it. What I love about it is it's very Marvel. It, I know it's a very it is it's very like, Marvel. They are afraid of drama. <laughs> no, I don't think they're, they're afraid, afraid, afraid of, of the conviction. <laughs> Of sticking to the conviction of these moments that they create, they I fashion, loved it. they build I, them up, and then they just pull. I all loved the air it. Out I thought it. it was fun. It was funny. And then after that, though, they give you all kind of drama where you know, would you kill me uh, if it meant not protecting your? Yeah, dude, I will slash your throat for Wakanda. And then we get that very yeah, dramatic. But you, well, now you have to try. It, they've since they've already pulled the air out of the balloon. Now that we got to, they got to quickly try and blow the balloon back up. But, but it's too I don't, late. See, I don't think they. I don't think they pulled the air out of the. Balloon. Balloon. If anything, what I think is they took a dramatic moment and let it crest and complete sort of that that arc. That yeah, dramatic but it's not arc. an arc. It's an abrupt stop, and then they got to quickly. I, I climb would disagree. That I again. think that entire battle essentially is an arc. And I yeah, think, but that battle is such a mess. There's what? so much going on. It's just so it much great. CGI. I thought it was great. Uh, I don't. Ca- I, I, it was impossible for me to care about anything that was going on. I thought it was great. Because there's it... so much artifice, uh, artifice to the whole thing. Well, it's a, it's a Marvel movie. Of yeah, course it's artifice. But they, I mean, going back to the movie, the thing about this movie, the movie's been chasing Return of the Jedi since Return of the Jedi. And this one is... 
well, doing I disagree that with that, again. But okay. Well, the third act of Return of the Jedi. I, where I disagree with that. <laughs> this movie is exactly that. It's the three battles going on in three different things and all these battles, blah, 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 and it's just a mess. I think it, I, I think structurally you're right, but, you know, really, that's every story. You can say that about every course. story going back to Shakespeare. So Look, I, don't, I don't think that's Return of the Jedi. That's just that's just drama. I mean, you know, you could I'm every so, plot I'm is... I'm trying same. to compare apples to apples, though. When we're talking about yeah. blockbusters and so on, Going back to the Marvel movie that I find is probably the strongest, Winter Soldier. Very good movie. The best scene in that movie, great movie, is in a glass box, okay. an elevator. It's one dude against you know ten other dudes in one box, the, and it's a fight scene. Mm-hmm. But that, and I'm not going to say there's no special effects in it. There are, but for the most part, it's simple compared. Okay. And the drama is is better. The build up, the suspense to it is better, and that leads to a much a, a very high special effects moment where he's on his motorcycle and jumps up, on and kills a plane. What? One but one man versus plane, he kills it. It's it, it's ar- that for my money is way more satisfying. But my, my argument to my argument to you would be if 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 Black Panther was devoid of that, then I might agree with you. If all we had was big, massive battles that weren't personal in nature, I might agree with you. I don't, but well, give me give me that. Well, we haven't seen that's in the club. That's not about CGI. That's a lot of that is about. But it's a ton of. It's just a mess. It's a ton of action. Oh going boy! On. I mean, if 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 somebody pulling out a spear, fighting two dudes on a battle, if that doesn't get your heart, LJ. I don't know what to tell you. I mean that. that I mean, that's amazing action in that club yeah, scene. That's fine. a wonderful scene. It's fine. If, if the guy standing on a cliff and two dudes in the water with, with spears advancing on them. And the once water he, was a problem. The was water problem? slowed it down and it hid the action. Oh, that was great. That was some of the it's best. It's visually interesting and arresting, but the action itself was obscured by the water, by oh, the, by God, the choice no. to put it in. God, no, that was water. one of the smartest uh, choices that they made. And it, and really, it has all of the things that you're talking about, sort of more personal, person-to-person action and the stakes that are physical and close in nature. That That's where you have uh, two of the biggest scenes that happen, like when that scene where, where uh, the, the antagonist seemingly best the protagonist in that scene. Oh, my God, that is such a stunning scene because even though you know – that the protagonist is most likely going to come back and may survive. What? It. Hold on a second. <laughs> what? How did you? I was completely shocked. Even though you know that, it's still a really I shock. Killmonger was the new Black Panther. I, I mean, it that's was where this was going. It was really shocking, though. I mean, that was a shocking scene. I was like, mm, was okay, it, I didn't was see it. Which is that? Was it shocking? It was a little bit shocking. I mean, you know, and what I like about this whole as film. As soon as we had the first fight scene, I, you know, the next one's going to be him losing. It's just. Well, what's interesting about this, the entire film is. Do, it, this movie is called, it's just foreshadow the movie is what this movie was. What hey, I like about we're not going to show you uh, the spear thing. It's like, we're not going to show you what these spears do. I'm going to tell you what these spears do. And guess what they're going to do in 10 minutes. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. Uh, we're going to have this fight scene, and there's going to be this guy you've never met before, but he'll kind of come in to play later. You know the good guy is going to win this one, but they're only doing it that way so that he can lose the second well, one. What's, what's interesting is is that in some way the antagonist does win. Like, in, This is what I found fascinating about the movie. Uh, although the, antag- the protagonist sort of wins the physical fight, he loses the intellectual argument. The protagonist essentially capitulates and says you know what uh evil antagonist you're right i don't like the way you're doing it and i don't like the way you'd want to do it but you're right and i've been wrong not only have i been wrong this uh gentleman who i look up to as my father my father's been wrong yeah uh t'chaka is wrong mm-hmm. And, and we've wrong, been wrong this yeah, whole we, time. We've been wrong this whole time. That scene where they're in the, uh, the afterworld and father is challenging, is being challenged by the son. And really, you need to understand a little bit. It helps to understand a little bit about African cultures when How the dare ancestors you patronized to me. No, I'm talking. <laughs> I'm from Africa. Either. I'm, okay, okay. I'm from somewhere off 55th. Right. But but in African culture, where those uh, where those ancestors are calling him home, mm-hmm. and he says no. You guys have screwed it up. I need to go back and fix this mess that you have left from. Oh my God, that's so powerful. No, it's it. I grant powerful. you that 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 Killmonger has a great point. 
He does. Is he a is a critical and a great move. Yeah, a little bit of a point. Yeah, he does. Uh, yeah, the way he goes about it, obviously. Yeah, oof, yeah not, not so good. <laughs> yeah. He's got some anger issues. But, but. Uh, you know, I, I sent you a link to another podcast, uh, Waypoint Radio, where they discussed an idea that I think is has some merit of, well, they let the hero off the hook a little bit. Because what mm. if Killmonger was still around? What if he didn't let Killmonger have this so-called victory of dying? What if he saved him against Killmonger's will? And now Killmonger is Loki in the next movie. Uh, and, and even has a better opportunity to be more than Loki was, which is to really challenge T'Challa and what he does in the future. I don't, I don't know. If, I just don't know if that works as well here. I mean, you know, he slit, You lose that moment. Well, he slit some people's throats. He, he murdered people close to uh, T'Challa. Oh, yeah. Um, he slit the general's uh, uh, d- underling's throat. I'm not saying he deserves it. Deserves no, I'm mercy, saying I'm but... just talking narratively, okay. not not in terms of anything emotional. I'm just saying as a narrative trope, I don't know that that plays as well. I, I think, agree. I don't think I it think does. that we can make Loki sort of the Eddie Haskell of the <laughs> of the of the universe, um, a little deceptive, a little deceitful. But just not outright murderous. I think that's a harder that's a harder corner to turn. I mean, you I think could, too, but I think it's an interesting corner. I think it's an interesting corner, but I I don't know that I would have went that way with it either. I don't know that because because uh, if if that character doesn't try to break out and try oh, to oh he'll kill, try yeah sure you know I I don't know I I kind of like that it had an arc that it actually began somewhere it crested and then it ended. To take that moment away, to me, one of the most powerful moments of the film is him sitting on his knees and you got this character overlooking this Wakandan sunset, Mm -hmm. uh, which was kind of weird because it it all of a sudden became sunset really way earlier than it should have. Oh, come on. But but I ignore that. My my job, I'm the nitpicker, sir. (laughs) You're taking away my job. (laughs) That aside, I was like, wait a minute. You were the one who says it's it's a movie. Okay. It's a movie. I just, I let it go. But I'm like, wait a minute, how is it, how is it sunset already? (laughs) That's my job. Thank you. They were just up. It was like 12 noon or something. It's a movie. It's a movie. So anyway, but that scene where he's on his knees and I just thought that was great. I thought that was like, that's, that's a nice touch. It's a nice touch visually. It's a nice touch narratively. It gives us a satisfying arc for a character, which you don't always get in superhero movies. True. So I kind of like that there was an arc for this guy that began, crested, and ended. You know, as opposed to okay, we're going to trot him out for another movie. <laughs> yeah. No. To be fair, not, I mean to to de- to play against my own question, I'm I'm pretty done with Loki. Yeah, I mean, point. if I see this dude one more yeah. time, and I love Ragnarok, I thought that was good. That but was it's enjoyable, like, but here Loki. we go again. Oh, and he's he's back. Yeah, the, the Loki's <laughs> yeah. the decisions Loki makes are clearly those that of the writers need a plot point to happen. A- exactly, it's he, not motivated. It's not, he, it's not clear what the hell. Yeah, I Loki mean, is or does or what. And he I'm wants. like, why would you trust Loki again? It's Loki. I mean, many times you got to get burned by this guy? Yeah, but then he does something, the quote unquote, that he's you know yeah, saves the day for yeah, reasons but, no one can fathom. Yeah, that makes no sense. Uh, yeah, I, you know. But uh, what's his name? The Fly, uh, Jeff Goldblum. Jeff, Go- Jeff Goldblum. What a treasure! Oh, I love Jeff Goldblum. What a treasure! And everything he does, I like him. That without him, that movie. Uh, there are people who don't like him in that movie, but for me, that movie. Yeah, is he got nothing. a lot of criticism. I thought he was that movie great. Is is half the movie. I thought Jeff it was Goldblum. great. I thought he was great. I think Jeff Goldblum brings a level of duplicity to a character that sometimes rises above the writing. He he brings this weird dichotomy that lives within the actor mm-hmm. that then transfers to the character, which I like. I, Wonderful, wonderful character, actor, and does great work. We need more Goldblum. Uh, we do. More Goldblum, please. More Goldblum, baby. Can't have a revolution without somebody to overthrow. So, uh, you're welcome. And uh, it's a tie. Yes. Oh, let's get him in the next Guardians movie, please. <laughs> I think he would be good. All right. Did we do it? Did we cover Black Panther? Did we hit all your points? I think we did. I did I complain we... enough about it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, hey, I like the movie. I don't need the uh, hate mail. I like the movie. It's uh, but it's another Marvel movie. I'm getting tired of it. Oof, it's a little more than that. Is it? Oh yeah. Well, it is. Look, it's historic. It, 
Yeah, I'll grant it's you a that. History but, making film. But that'll bring me to. I think it's. I think it's being elevated for those reasons. And, and here's the problem with me. Okay. I uh, I'm white. I don't know if you knew that. You are. Um, You're a I'm white used guy. to. I'm used to being catered to. Uh, <laughs> movies are for me, I guess. My perspective, unfortunately, is here's another movie. Uh-huh. Um, your perspective might be different. Well, I mean, there are some things that are subjective, but I'm not. I'm, I'm throwing away the subjective. Okay. I'm just talking about the objective. All right. It's in its third week, and it's literally the eighth grossing film of all time. No, I got it. Look, that's, Transformers that's, Three made a ton of money. Well, yeah, but it's just it's more than it just made a ton of uh, made a ton of money. It made the eighth most amount in history. That's that's a little more than a ton of money, and and it and it did it in a franchise that is a money machine. Yeah. So when you when you outstrip Winter Soldier, which is a great film, uh, Civil War made way more than uh, uh, Winter Soldier. Okay, fair enough. But w- which is but, not a great in my. It's fine. Yeah, it, I so, put Winter. I put Civil War and Black. I will Panther say right now, Black place. Panther in its third week is the third gross, grossing Marvel movie of all time. Now, sure. Let's check it next year. It may be the highest grossing movie Look, I, Marvel's ever made, and it'll probably be in the top five. If you want to talk objectively, with just money equals whatever. Well, I'll give you, I, I'll give you, I'll give you a great example. If I'm teaching a film class, I got to talk about Titanic when I talk about blockbusters and how those sure. are structured. And that's not subjective. That's just an objective no, truth. I think that Black Panther, because I hear people arguing, like <clears throat> I hear conservatives particularly, shows and things, these conservatives, and they're talking about, oh, people making a big deal because it's black and because it has African. Da, da, da. <laughs> and my thing is, okay, that's it's a fair. good movie. That's a fair argument, but it's, it's more than a good movie. So let's move out of the, the subjective. Let's throw that out. Just objectively, people talked a lot about Titanic because it was just a gargantuan film that became almost like a a, a cultural moment. Whether you liked Titanic or didn't like it, I'm saying Black Panther is elevating to that. And that's something that goes above the fact that it's black or blacks like it or that it has African, whatever. You could throw all of that out. The second that you are in the top 10 films in history, Mm-hmm. And you've done that in your third week. Mm-hmm. Man, that's pretty amazing. Yeah, and you've right. done it with a freaking superhero movie. Sure. That's pretty amazing. I mean, and it's getting to that level. Where will it be six weeks from now? I don't I don't disagree with nothing you said. Yeah, so that, but I'm just saying, I'm not even arguing towards you. I I'm disrespectfully just, agree. <laughs> I'm just talking about, I keep hearing people make an argument, oh, it's just a movie. Well, no, it's not. Titanic wasn't just a movie, and I wasn't even crazy about Titanic. I thought it was decent, but you can't just say, "Yeah, it was just a movie." I know I mean, t- cultural phenomenon, fine, but it, <clears throat> the point is, for me, it's of a similar quality to some of the more three-star Marvel movies. It's it's okay, it's I would, enjoyable. It's I would disrespectfully <laughs> disagree. Disagree? With that. Okay. Oh yeah, it, this is a civil. This is right up there with Civil War for me. Oof, boy. No, it's at the top. If it's not one, it's 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 neck and neck with one just because the writing is just to a level where it's just really good stuff, really good lines, really good characters, and it's something that um, transcended what Marvel has done so far. Sometimes there's a reason why you sell more tickets. Yeah, it's true that sometimes you do Transformers 2 and you sell a bunch of tickets and it's an empty movie and blah, blah, skippy. But sometimes there's a reason why you sell more than the other guy. Sometimes there's a reason why people go back and see the movie two and three times. Sometimes that's not just because the audience is stupid. Sometimes they Did do. Did I say that? I'm not talking about you. Okay. I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not directing that at you. Right. But I'm just saying sometimes there's a reason why you sell more than the other guy. Sure. Sometimes... Sometimes you just built a better mousetrap, and that, that's got to be acknowledged. And it's a well-constructed film. I, I agree, and I think that people are going to look back on the film, and they're going to study it in film school. It's that kind of film. Mm, do you think film school is going to be around? <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> I don't know about that one. I saw, I saw uh, what's his name, um, Wesley Snipes, Okay. an interview he did, and I felt so bad for Wesley. I mean, Why? He's fine. Yeah, he's fine. He's Blade. Yeah, but he was that's Passenger fifty seven. He was like he was like everybody acting like this is brown breaking breaking. What about Blade? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, 
about I was like, well, what about Blade? Yeah, what about Blade, man? People forget that uh, about Blade. People do not forget about Blade. That's what, well, first of all, Blade is not Black Panther. Blade is Blade. It's Blade. Well, there, there Speaking a, of which, Guillermo del Toro did a Blade movie. Oh, that's Blade right. Blade number two. Yeah. I did a Blade. I did a, a Black movie. Oscar winner. Guillermo. I did a... That's, I did a black I did a black movie with a superhero and it's like, well no you didn't. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I mean I watched uh, I watched Mantis on Fox. <laughs> That's a deep pull. <laughs> I watched every episode of Mantis. Yeah, with uh what's his name? Um God, I know the actor too. Uh shame on me. I know that yeah, actor. Yeah, but he was in um Alias. Yeah, he was in um, Alias, he was in LA Law, he was in what's his name? And that show was Dog shit. I watched every episode. Yeah. Because it was a superhero show on TV. Exactly. And what I would tell my dear, dear, bitter Wesley Snipes mm-hmm. is, you did a movie in which the lead character happened to be black, but there was nothing black about Blade. It just wasn't. Oh, interesting. You did a movie where the guy just happened to be black. That's a little different than what's happening. In so it, uh, so this one, since it plays on, and it uh, plays on, this sounds negative. Since it incorporates cultural iconography and themes. Well, I wouldn't say just incorporates. I, I say weave it as the main plot process. So as a scholar myself, um, when you read stuff like Samuel Delaney or you read Octavia Butler, essentially they... Nobody they, reads, but go ahead. They, <laughs> they've taken Octavia Butler, who was one of the, well, I would say, the greatest African-American science fiction writer in the history of this country, or Samuel Delaney, who's also a science fiction writer. These African-American authors would take African-American tropes and weave them into the genre of, of science fiction. Mm-hmm. What Kugler has done is he's done an answer to that for the screen. That's not what Blade was. Blade was a, a character that could have been white or Jewish. It wouldn't have mattered. It, it, you know, he, he could have been anything. He doesn't. There's, there really are no tropes that, that matter because he's black. He just happens to be black. T'Challa doesn't happen to be African or happen to be black. Part of why that story works is he has to be black. If he's not black, then the story doesn't make sense. <laughs> if Killmonger well, is a on Jew, now. hold on, hold on. If not, Killmonger I'm, is a Jewish guy, that that dog don't look, hunt. Look, I am, <clears throat> I am, uh, I don't know about you. It sounds like you're uh, against this, but I I uh, appreciate diversity in film. Me too. Come on, colorblind casting. That is the future. Yeah, because I've done so well with that. Oh, well, yeah. You've learned your lesson. <laughs> yeah. That's right. I, did, I have not been scarred by this as you have. <laughs> yeah. That's worked out so well for yeah. me. All right, fair enough. I, my uh, snarky uh, uh, joke uh, withdrawn. So, yeah, if we, made, if we made Blade Ryan Reynolds, would it really matter? Not really. I think we did. <laughs> that was Blade 3. Yeah, right. <laughs> Would it really matter? Wesley Snipes just hung out in his trailer the whole movie. <laughs> exactly. So they hired Ryan Wesley. Reynolds just kind of right. walked like, in. All right, Ryan. Uh, yeah, he's, he's not coming out. Do. So yeah, it's the same thing. Just go do whatever he was going to do. And <laughs> you and Jessica Biel can just look adorable. Absolutely. Thanks for tuning in to our inaugural episode of, what's it called? Disrespect. It's, it's hard to remember. Disrespect. Uh, Thanks for tuning into our inaugural episode of Disrespectfully. Disagree. No. Oh, agree. Thank you. Disrespectfully, disrespectfully agree. agree. You dis- you tried to change it. No. Disrespectfully. <laughs> to disrespectfully disagree. No. Disrespectfully agree. That happened earlier. We'll see you later. Peace and chicken grease.